skills of these players that we have here on stage. Like this is this is going to be a really great match. The fact that we get this already in the tournament in our fourth round in, I think is just absolutely insane. I think that's something that I've been really surprised pleasantly by going into the Scarlet and Violet events is that we've been able to see a lot of top trainers rise to the occasion. Um, and I think a lot of that actually has to do with the fact that we have open team sheets. There's no surprises. You get to plan for everything and it ends up coming down to positional focus as well as target focus. Can you really nail down the right Pokemon? I I know the team sheet debate is a debate. Like there is definitely people there who are on both on sides of the coin. That's for sure. Both sides. But I do like the skill that comes out when there's not going to be a gimmick that really influences the battle. Not something that's thrown at you 40 minutes in that all of a sudden you lose for something that you couldn't have really planned for. Mm. So I like the open team sheets personally because the addition of the Terra types, just how much of an impact those can make either offensively or defensively, adding that as another potential gimmick. I mean, we've seen people all of a sudden Terra fire into what would have been a super effective grass hit right. and it does nothing. Adding another level of, oh my God, gimmick, would have just, I think, been terrible. So I really like the Omen team sheet with that and being able to see these players play at the full strength of just, I know the information, now how do I play my very best game? Yeah, I think especially when you've got 18 different terror types to choose from, since the whole slate is available, it's to a lot of information to be able to garner in just two games. So even if you go to a three game set, it's still not enough to be able to get that full information. So yeah. you could have a tech surprise of a terror type that just catches you off guard. Yeah, and there's the people, oh, well, gathering information is also a skill. And I do not disagree with that. Absolutely not. But I feel like that kind of adapts into, and this was always there, but even more so now, how your opponent plays because mm -hmm. then you can start going for those reads of okay well i know that their hydreigon is a fire terra for example right do i want to be going for a fairy move into that or do i not want to and do i want to call it be fire and then go for this rock move i feel like there is that next level of predicting to outplay your opponent because True. your opponent all of a sudden if they're playing predictably with the tools that they have you can start learning the information that way. Yeah, I think that's a really good point to make as well, where you're looking at maybe even information overload, looking at a team sheet, and it's like, okay, well, I know that they have these choices available, but is that actually what they're going to go for? Uh, switch. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> hey, well, like, is there going to be a switch that comes through, protect? Like, there's so many different aspects that still play a role that do allow for variance within the game. It's not just looking at the sheet and kind of like 4D chessing it of like, okay, well, how do I position my board to actually take the win here? There's a lot of other surprises that can get thrown in too, like a surprise Terra. You know what the type is gonna be, but you don't know if it's actually gonna head your way. Yeah, because any Pokemon can Terra. And I, I love the viability of any Pokemon at any point can go for a Terra, whether True. it is offensively or defensively, as opposed to Dynamax. I mean, technically, Yes, almost any Pokemon could save Zashi and Zamazenta, but at the same time, not every should. You know, <laughs> there's some Pokemon that you see, you see the Moon, you just Dynamax, and you're all of a sudden, wait, what led to this point? The desperation in <laughs> Cinnaror Dynamaxes at some point. Whereas with the terrestrialization, sometimes that defensive on a defensive Pokemon is just the best move to make sure that it's going to be living through a certain turn or we see a lot of grass terrors that so they're not going to get spored or redirected the rage powder. Right. And I love that viability. Yeah, I think um, especially with... I'm just like the timing of things. Like I'm thinking about the timing of actually terrestrializing because I think that's a really difficult skill. Mm -hmm. You called out maybe some really unique... <laughs> Dynamax options, like, uh, shout out to Aaron Trailer, who maybe played the best defensive Dynamax game in Sword and Shield. Um, shout out to Dynamax and Didi and Whimsicott. That was awesome. Um, but even just with, with, when it comes to the timing of terrestrialization, we've seen terrestrialization either be a boon or a bane to your game plan. Yeah, because once you're terrestrialized, you're kind of locked into that. So all of a sudden, you could have made, like even earlier, there was the Terra Steel. Okay, you're good against a fairy move. All of a sudden, this fire move comes up. Oh no, things are not looking so great anymore. So that's kind of one of those things that you really need to be thinking about as well. Because you only get it for one Pokemon. That is stuck with that Pokemon until it gets KO'd. And what could be good for that one moment, or even just half decent in that one moment, can all of a sudden, three turns later, be the reason you lose the game. And there's still 
Yeah. A lot of debate on when to use the Terra, but I feel like there's still a couple of people that kind of burn it too early. Kind of like with when Sword and Shield came on and people burnt the Dynamax the first turn of the game and, you know, just go for that offense pressure. Hey, but sometimes it works. <laughs> I mean, it definitely just sometimes works. Like, do not get me wrong. Like, <laughs> uh, make it rain, steal Godango first turn. Like, that could definitely do some damage. Definitely. There's also some times, though, you should maybe hold on to that for a couple, a couple turns. Wait on it. Uh, I think it's tough because you have pressure on the board that can come from those turn one leads, and so maybe sometimes that does bait you into using the Terra a little bit early. Uh, but you got to call it right. I think that's why playing Pokemon has always been such a mental game, is can you get those calls right? Can you figure out when to Terra, what to Terra, and is it going to end up actually being a pivotal part of your game plan? And in some cases, too, terrestrialization doesn't have to last the entire game. It just has to be enough to be able to get you that one or two turn advantage. Yeah, just make sure that you're surviving the KO or with the Grass Terra that is pretty common out there, right. that you're going to be able to do what you want against Amoongus and not be redirected or spored down. So that's just important, as long as it's not putting you into a type that later yes. on is uh, <laughs> you, There is some Arcanines running around, you know. They'll, There's a lot. They'll, they'll feast on those Grass Terras. It's true. I, I think that's actually a really important thing to talk about is the difference in usage for Intimidate users. Yeah. I think a lot of us were quite surprised during San Diego and Liverpool just how many Paldean Tauros were running around, either the mm. Aqua or the Blaze breed. And it seems as if those have taken a bit of a backseat towards Arcanine. And Arcanine has been one of those types of Pokemon that was around a lot in the earlier days of Sword and Shield. And then Incineroar came along and that ended up being the better Intimidate user. But Arcanine provides a ton of value with the Intimidate option, as well as just having access to that priority extreme speed, which we've seen from Dragonite can be absolutely devastating. It's definitely not dealing as much as you know that Terra normal dragon yes. history speed, but <laughs> we've gotten to see before being able to just clean up a KO when necessary is so nice. But what I want to call from here, we're going away from that whole extreme speed debate. Remember when we were talking about paradoxes that may or may not be good and what could be <laughs> a little bit iffy? Look at that scream tail over on <laughs> Wolfie's end of things. I am intrigued about that. Yeah, it's almost like we set it up. <laughs> the script hey, itself. You, you looked at them before and I did. No, this is, no, this is me catching I up now. I cheated. I cheated and I looked at the team sheets. No, but in all seriousness, I think Screamtail is one of those really interesting Pokemon that could play a bit of a role here. It's known for getting access to Parish Song, and it also has the pressure of being able to go for something like an Encore and Disable as some of those supportive options that exist with that Pokemon. And so that's something that Chongqing is going to have to play around with when you also see the Gothitelle on Wolf's side with the Shadow Tag ability being able to lock down Chongqing's Pokemon. And that lock is so important for a couple of different things. First off, you can make sure that your opponent locks into something that's just not a favorable spark. start. Pivoting is so big in Pokemon, especially when you're going up against something like a Dondo's a Tatsugiri, where it's all about making sure you're in that right position. Gothitelle locks that down. Also notably, um, you know, Parish Song is also just a thing right now. And all of a sudden, uh, you don't want to be going up against a Shadow Tag where something can just Parish Song you in, and all of a sudden you've just lost two Pokemon because you can swap. Yeah, that is going to be a bit of an issue, but even looking at Chongjun's team, let's remember that Ghost-type Pokémon in front of a Shadow Tag ability Pokémon can switch out. Mm -hmm. So there is that Fluttermane available from Chongjun's side, which is going to be a dual-type Ghost and Fairy Pokémon that should be able to get that pivot out if that Gothitelle does make an appearance. But the other thing on Wolf's side is uh, we saw a lot of Palafin show up in Liverpool, but it was usually paired with something like the Pelipper to enable more powerful aqu uh, Aqua Jets, Jet Punches, just those water type attacks. And that's actually not a Pokemon that's present on Wolf's team, opting to leave that home in favor of something that's gonna provide a little bit more offensive pressure. Hey, I mean, I like the offensive pressure. Already, you're needing to make sure that within a series two, that your Pokemon aren't going to be outclassed by these paradoxes coming in. So I feel like a couple of Pokemon that are a little bit more viable before are not as much anymore. So I'm here for it.
Yeah, the other side, though, when you look at Chong Jun's team, is he does have some really slow options as well as some pretty speedy options. That Tatsugiri is actually going to be the curly form, so if you do use Order Up, then you will be getting an attack increase for your Dondozo. Um, but also looking at the Brute Bonnet making an appearance here on this team, too, um, it's got some really nice offensive pressure with it as well. I think one of the things about Brute Bonnet that makes it maybe a more interesting choice to tech onto a team other than the Amoongus is that it does have access to a few more attacking moves and it seems like that's going to play a nice role here on Chong Jun's team too. And I want to make a quick call out in this Age of Paradox Pokemon sticking with the Volcarona. It did get a Paradox in both Ancient and in Future with that Slitherwing, Rip Slitherwing, as well as that Iron Moth. But Volcarona just itself is such a strong Pokemon. It definitely has a little bit of, of bulk, but being able to still have the ability to go for something like a Cover Dance, maybe not in this case, because there is definitely a couple of different Volcaronas that can be built. But this one, if hey, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I like the classic, you know? <laughs> No, I agree with you. I think that Volcarona, especially when you use Iron Moth instead, uh, does lose access to Rage Powder, so it doesn't provide as much supportive utility uh, as maybe you would want to have on the team because Chung Jun certainly needs to fill some of that role, and so you do have the Brute Bonnet that will provide a little bit of that uh, protection, but also with the Volcarona, you have a way to redirect away any attacks with that Rage Powder. And as of right now, Wolf doesn't have too many answers unless you're looking at the Amoongus specifically uh, to be able to, to draw away from that or maybe a Grass Terra, which is on the Flutter main. Definitely at least one way to get around that, though the other way is also just to KO and just do as much uh, damage as possible because there definitely is those options over on Wolf's end. So I'm definitely intrigued to see how that's going to be pairing up against each other, especially I feel like there's definitely a bunch of the fun new tools over on Wolf's side. And yes, the fun tools over on Chong Jun's as well, but class paired up with that classic Tatsugiri Dondoza that we've we've come to know so well. <laughs> we have, and so I think that that Dondoza Tatsugiri will play a bit of a role here for Chong Jun's team. And then you're looking at Wolf's Arcanine with the Intimidate to really help play a role here. The Arcanine does have the safety goggles as well, so in front of the Volcarona, you're not really looking at having that Rage Powder make too much of an effect either, but we're not seeing the Arcanine right now. No, instead it'll be a Flutterman on both ends. No surprise with just how strong this Pokemon is. Here with that Volcarona on Strong Jun's end with Palafin over on Wolf. A Palafin, I mean, multiple different ways to go for it because even talking out is nice, but it also just does it good amount of damage by itself. Which is something that people actually often don't think about, is that Palafin, yes, it can make a raw pivot here, so it can go use that zero to hero ability to become the hero form Palafin, but it also is a great way to be able to break sashes on your opponent's side. Uh, and it looks like we're gonna see a switch here from Chongjun to kick things off. Yeah, Volcarona definitely would not appreciate a trap punch, though, instead targeting into the Flutter main spot. It will deal a good chunk of damage, but going first, do a huge Shadow Ball back to the Fluttermane over on Wolf's end. A Shadow Ball for a Shadow Ball, though, and already so chunked down. That is going to be the first KO taken. Now, the Fluttermane out of the way puts Wolf into such a nice position, just having that offensive threat off of Tong Jun's board. It does provide Tong Jun a free switch here, so maybe you want to go for the Brute Bonnet. At least that's been teched in. Brute Bonnet has access to Sucker Punch, so it could go for a Sucker Punch into the Fluttermane on Wolf's side just to be able to knock it out, but that Palafin did a ton of work there. We're going to see the King Gambit actually shown off for Tong Jun's fourth Pokémon. And this was another Pokemon that was able to do pretty well in Series 1. I mean, it already just deals so much damage by itself. I mean, great typing. Also, you're talking about that access to Sucker Punch. It is a Pokemon that's going to be able to do that and do that well and make sure that anything that you want to intimidate it down isn't going to do much thanks to that defiant ability. So two Pokemon that could have priority in this case, but it's time for our first Terrestrialization of the battle. It will be that King Ambit and we're going for that fairy terror type. This fairy terror type is a new tech that we've seen on King Gambit. A lot of the King Gambit we've seen on stream have been that Terra flying, but I love the fairy tech here because look at that. Nice survival. It's going to do a lot less damage, followed up by 
this close combat that's going to do even less look at the king gambit nice and healthy sitting on his throne with over half hp left Kotel leave the palafin is going to deal a bunch more damage followed up with this bullet seed to take this palafin out of the equation palafin i think has already done its job in this case you're looking at pokemon on chongchun's side that are not going to be too threatened by the Palafin in later turns of the game. And so maybe having the pivot out is not as impactful for Wolf as being able to get a nice safe switch in here as the Amoongus gets to come in for free and at full health. So you can take a couple of hits, use the regenerator ability to switch the Amoongus back out and be able to save it for later, especially knowing that there's a few Pokemon on Chongjun's side that would be able to get put to sleep. Yeah, at this point you have Amoongus and you have Cooler Amoongus out on the field. So I definitely <laughs> like this face down. Sucker Punch onto the Fluttermane on Wolf's end. It had to do so little and Fluttermane is going down. Now an Iron Head right into the Amoongus. is gonna take that oh so well. Now a Pollen Puff back in. Pollen Puff not really known to be one of those moves that does a lot of damage, but Fortune Effectiveness is definitely gonna leave its mark. Yeah, I mean that Dark type for the group on it. It's definitely not going to be too happy to be on the receiving end of that, but it is the Screamtail as Wolf's fourth and final Pokemon. You can see that Protosynthesis activating there, and so it's going to give a little bit more staying power there to that Screamtail, uh, and you're looking at trying to make sure that this King Gambit's not going to be able to put too much pressure on you here. Yeah, the King Gambit definitely could go for a strong attack into this at this point, and the Screamtail I mean, yeah, it might be speedy, but at the same time, I'm looking at what it does, and I'm not really liking the options other than that. Amoongus, well, the Brute Bonnet, apologies, the Cooler Amoongus, swapping out, bringing the Volcarona in on the receiving end of this play rough. Not too much damage, and the Kill Cleave will do a good chunk into this Amoongus right down, but now a Spore. That is going to be so great in making sure this King Gambit at least has to sleep it out for one turn. Yeah, I, I mean, you're looking at just ha the King Gambit having some really nice options with the Iron Head available. That's going to do super effective damage to the Screamtail. Um, so while it's asleep, King Gambit's going to have to get taken out here. So little damage, though, and now the Amoongus won't have a chance to return anything as it will be KO'd down thanks to that Struggle Bug. So now, just this poor Screamtail. King Gambit, of course, this will be the turn of sleep, but I mean, he can doze off right through until the next match at this point. This Screamtail is not going to do much. And sure enough, throwing in the hat for at least the first one to get on the way with game two. Uh, I mean, at that point, I think Wolf doesn't want to give up too many strategies here. And having the Screamtail as the final Pokemon available, Chongjun definitely had a firm lockdown on that game number one. I love the fact that he was able to bring in the King Gambit. That was a very smart Terra to go to that Fairy type instead. You saw how little damage that close combat was going to do, removing that four times super effective weakness for the King Gambit. Um, but also, Leaving the Dondozo and Tatsugiri at home, making sure that the group on it, the Fluttermane were putting on enough offensive pressure. And that's really, really smart there. I mean, I think Wolf in, in some ways was kind of prepping for that duo to potentially come out. And unfortunately, it just wasn't really enough there. Palafin maybe not doing enough. Said it did its job, but maybe not enough for that first game. I mean, Palafin could be such a strong Pokemon, so sure, it managed to set up for the KO, but at the same time, I would argue it's not enough because I want to see a little bit more out of a Pokemon that literally has an ability zero to hero. I'm looking for it to be the hero. I'm looking for a setup and to be able to dish out these priority moves doing so much damage. And unfortunately, just it would take two Pokemon to KO one in return, and then nothing was able to hit through at that very end. So definitely a little bit on the back but, but what would you like to see coming out here in this game too? Well, I think that the Arcanine is a really tough bring here for Wolf. You do have the King Gambit that has that Defiant ability. And so if you're even looking at trying to target it down, actually with even moves coming in from the Flutter main, this is something that I feel like we're gonna need to talk about a little bit more and maybe we'll see some examples of this over the weekend. But Flutter main has quite a few attacks that can actually drop stats. Yes, I'm looking at Moonblast uh, as one of those that are available to the Flutter main um, that would actually drop a stat. So if Chongjun is able to get that switch in, maybe you're going to see that happening. And even Shadow Ball is a 20% chance of lowering the target special defense by one stage. So literally any stat drop could be detrimental and give that King Gambit too much staying power. 
Well, it will be the King Gambit to lead things off this time around on Changjing's end of the field with that Fluttermane. Fluttermane again over on Wolf's side, this time paired up with that Amoongus. So the Amoongus is going to be able to redirect away a few attacks here for Wolf. You do have the Rage Powder, but I think the Pollen Puff is also a really nice move to see tacked onto most of the Amoongus in case you are worried about getting knocked out. Uh, but moves were selected very quickly for this turn number one. The trainers knew. They, they came into this game too with a plan. And I feel like a lot of the time with the Fluttermains, the plan is click Shadow Ball because it's going to be doing so much damage. Yet again, survival. I'm sure with how prevalent Fluttermane is this weekend, that is definitely something to be trained to take. So arrival on both ends. Iron Head just to start dealing damage into the Amoongus as it fires back a score. Yet again, King Gambit for game two is going to be put to sleep. And this time, even in maybe a more precarious position, it hasn't terrestrialized. And I don't know if you're really looking to terrestrialize it just yet. Chongju may be waiting a couple of turns. Uh, but that Iron Head could have been pretty detrimental to Wolf's game plan had it gotten that small flinch chance. But as of right now, I think Wolf is in a bit of a better position here. You could go for... Uh, even just kind of looking at Parish Song as being one of the options here on the Flutter main. You can lock down a couple more options on Chongjun's team and force him into a position where Chongjun's going to have to switch out his Pokemon. Will it be Protect over on Chongjun's end to make sure that it can't get attacked into, but the Parish Song, I mean, that's just a whole field effect. Any Pokemon hearing that Curse Song is going to be perishing in three turns. Nothing on the field at for trapping. Spore just to follow up will hit into the Protect. It was a really nice coverage option there for Wolf in case you saw the Flutter Main get switched out, then you have the ability to put something else in the back asleep, or you just put the Flutter Main to sleep, and then you have no problems here. But now, Chongjun's on a timer. You do have three turns until that count will fall to zero, and as well, when you're looking at the switch options that is available on Wolf's team, maybe you can go ahead and start doing some damage, maybe expect some type of switch in, because Chongjun's the one on the back foot here. Yeah, and at this point, too, targeting into anything on Chongjin's end, you're either going to be picking up this KO, hey, get Pokemon. rid of this really tricky Pokemon, or you're going to be doing a bunch of damage to whatever is going to be coming in into its place, because you are going to have to be forcing a pivot at some point. Already seeing the effects of that as the King Gambit is going to be swapping out, bringing in that Volcarona. The target, though, into the Flutter Maiden instead will ensure that KO. Yeah, nice knockout here. Now we're going to see Chungjun figure out how to deal with two sleeping Pokemon now. The Volcarona also getting put to sleep. So a nice call there to identify that that King Gambit was going to switch out. And now you have the King Gambit and the Volcarona taking a nap. Yeah, though notably at this point too, nothing on Chungjun's end is going to be perishing in so many amount of turns. It'll just be on Wolf's end. Something to be keeping mind of, but it looks like a really quick click just into a, hey, we're just gonna keep forcing this Parish Song while we still have this option. And I mean, hey, Parish Song shenanigans, I, I'm here for it. I think that this is really nice for Wolf to, a nice position for Wolf to be in as well. You have the Gothitelle that's gonna be in the back. So if you identify a position where you can pin down two Pokemon that you would really like to actually faint to the song, then you can absolutely do that. Uh, we're gonna see the Screamtail switch in here. Make sure that you know, it's going to be reset on this field of Parish Songness, making sure the Amoongus can go out and potentially be swapped in later in place of this Screamtail as Parish Song rings through again. Volcarona is going to be taking that mandatory turn of sleep, and the King Gambit is going to wake up notably. That'll be an Iron Head's perfect hit into the Screamtail. Screamtail's still pretty bulky though, so you're gonna be able to see that survive. But now, you know, Fluttermane on Wolf's side is going to be on its parish count number one. So this is the perfect opportunity to switch in the Gothitelle here if you want to be able to lock down the Volcarona and the King Gambit on the other side. But you also have access to that Amoongus. Look at with that regenerator ability, just how much HP that Amoongus was able to heal up after being swapped out. And I'm really down for this use of Parish Song. I feel like it's very untraditional to what you could see in just like that lead with the Parish Song in the trap or with that end game scenario. But instead, consistently forcing these swaps over on Chongjin and with the fact that he has to keep going with that Parish Song, I think it's so interesting. And if nothing swapped out, well then these two Pokemon on the field could be there to stay thanks to the arrival of this Gothitelle. Double swap, the Amoongus as well coming out onto the field and no swaps on the other end. 
No, Volcarona is just going to go for the overheat here right into the Gothitel. So a nice switch for that Gothitel to come in to that place. And especially now that Volcarona is stuck in here, that special attack drop is going to stick. It is, but I'm still more worried about this Parachon. Two left and now trapped out onto the field. It could have been an opportunity to last turn to swap in, but as long as that Gothitelle wants to be sticking around, that is going to be something that's stuck. Gothitelle, not necessarily known for the most offensive pressure, but what it lacks in that, it definitely makes up for in other annoying things, such as a fake out. Yes, we're going to see the fake out right now being targeted into the King Gambit. You're not worried too much about the Volcarona at the moment because it's really not pressuring you anymore as it's used the overheat and dropped its special attack. Even if it goes for something like the struggle bug as we saw in game number one, you're really looking at trying to target down those special attackers in order to get those drops. But let's switch here first for Wolf as we saw him hover over that in the game preview. And it'll be the Amoongus yet again going to the back and the Fluttermane coming out. Fake out to ensure that the King Gambit's not going to do anything this turn as overheat into the Fluttermane. Sure, there already was the special attack drop, but not needing to really do too much damage into the Fluttermane. It is going to do enough in this scenario and let Wolf have another swap. Yeah, I think that you're looking really at just being able to pivot out your own Pokemon so that you don't have to deal with those Parish counts anymore. So Screamtail that gets to come back in for free and Chongjun once again on that timer, you saw that Parish count falling to one. So he really only has one more turn to try to get as many knockouts as possible. And a protector on the Gothitelle would ensure that that Shadow Tag ability will stay up and active. You mean even just the double protect, I mean, there is nothing that can be done over on Chongjun's end at this point to try and break through this. You can't swap, you can't KO these Pokemon. Even if you were to be able to go for a KO, you still can't swap after because the Parish is going to be done after this turn. It's a really great way of pivoting. Yeah, the Flutter Main went down, but you have a Pokemon with that Protect option. And sure enough, the double Protect on both sides doesn't really matter what's done on the other end of the field. No, this is going to be the final turn here for the Volcarona and the King Gambit. And that's going to leave Chongjun with his fourth and final Pokemon. So you're hoping that that will be enough to bring Chongjun back into this game. At least you know that the Screamtail is pretty low HP right now. And, you know, the Gothitelle, maybe that's going to be pressured down by something super effective in the back. But it's not looking good at the moment as we're going to see those Parish Counts fall. That's always a really satisfying but a really sad thing to see is just the HP bar just completely <laughs> depleted at the end of the turn as it just falls it through the Parasound. So sure, just one Pokemon left. Still have to be worried though. It is going to be that Brute Bonnet. I don't think a Pokemon that can really stand on its own, but the thing is, is there is more than one Pokemon over on Wolf's team that has access to that Parish Song. Yeah, so you could technically do this again and try to pivot around. You're just worried about putting yourself into a position where you have two Pokemon left and then everything gets knocked out, right? So we'll see the Amunga switch in here, maybe keeping the Gothitelle for later. It served a lot of its purpose and could go for a fake out later. But here's the Parish Song, like you said, and we'll see if Wolf can pivot around this to make sure that he's not going to fall victim to it. And at this point, you still have one in the back. So you just have to make sure that after the screen tail goes down, the last Pokemon isn't going to be falling to the Parasong, so that will be so nice. And even then, I believe it's the slowest thing on the field. And the Amoongus, um, the regular Amoongus, definitely hits that slow criteria. Yeah, I think you're okay with the Amoongus on the field still listening to the song. You get to switch the Gothitelle back in here. It could go for Fake Out, mm -hmm. and you still have the Pollen Puff on Wolf's Amoongus to be able to deal that super effective damage. So even if it ends up not being able to get the knockout onto the group on it, you can also still use that to the side in order to make sure that that Gothitelle still stays nice and healthy. And out of knockout range. Yeah, and a great way to make sure that even despite the protect over on Chongjun's end, that you're still going to be doing something with the turn because this Gothitelle is going to be the one that isn't going to fall to any parish things at the end of a couple of turns. So that completely full health now is we're talking through this battle like there's anything that could be done. There's two turns left to this. I don't really see a way to pursue this. No, and you can at least go for some damage here if you really want to with the Amoongus, but the double protect here from Wolf is so safe, knowing that the Brute Bonnet would have one more turn of Parish after this, and you're not going to get threatened to like a critical hit knockout here on the Gothitelle, which could be a problem. And just the fact you have two turns to deal with these two Pokemon, the fact they have the protect, the Gothitelle, of course, first turn going for it, hits that freely. The Amoongus is just, you know, 
for the funds is going to hit the protect going to hit the protect as well so that's going to be so nice and bullet seed not going to do anything one more turn left in the battle there's nothing that can be done except think about what can be done here in the next game yeah i think this was a game that was really really well played by wolf parish song yes sometimes people look at that and say hey little cheesy when you have the shadow tag ability on Me, the gothitelle i'm one of those people yeah I, hey <laughs> <laughs> listen at least you can admit it right <laughs> um but i think that the parish song teams and Parish Trap in particular are really difficult to play around sometimes just depending on how you are able to position those Pokemon and that's why it's a archetype. Yes, it can work, but also if it's in the right player's hands, um, that's really when you end up seeing it effective. Chung is still going to try though. You're going to see the Bullet Seed hit into the Gothitelle, but it really is about looking at what's going to happen for this third and final game as both players will be 1-1. And I want to keep that Parish Song discussion going a little bit more as we're wrapping this up. Parish count falls to zero. This Brute Bonnet is out of there. It is going to be a one game for Wolf. But the fact that this Parish count isn't necessarily even being used in a cheesy way, but instead consistently forcing pivots out, making sure that there can never be a setup, never be a comfortable position, I feel was so masterfully done. And that is going to be something that has to be huge consideration in this next game because no matter what you bring out, now you know, okay, it can be Trap, it can be Parish Song. You have to be so careful with your four Pokemon and your decisions from here on out. Absolutely. I think that's something that we see a lot of utility on Wolf's team. You've got the Flutter main that's going to be able to deal a lot of damage, and even the Gothitelle putting in that work, too. I wasn't really even just trying to get a raw knockout, but you're absolutely right that when you saw the Parish Song, go off earlier on in game number two, Chong Jun immediately recognized that he's going to have to pivot out some Pokemon, but Wolf seemed like he was just one step ahead, looking at maybe what's in the back, what you could potentially see switching into those slots. The Spore was very effective. A lot of utility, maybe not so much damage, but it definitely did the work it needed to. What the Parish Song pivots remind me of is yawn, because at that point, the pivots are predictable. I mean, there's literally a timer on the Parish Song. So you know roughly when that's going to be swapped out and being able to target something like a Spore into the Pokemon that's coming in. So it comes into something that is then going to help further advance your board state. I think is just so important as well because it's, you can really just make sure that these Pokemon that are a bit more passive like this Amoongus, sometimes you don't always get the option to go for the Spores, but when Pokemon are consistently pivoting and not getting the option to attack, well, that's just free reign. Yeah, I think something else about Parish Trap is if it works once, maybe your opponent is considering that it'll work a second time and you can kind of counter team the counter team in a way. If Chung Jun is expecting the Parish Trap to come out again, then let's see what he decides to do in response. Team preview is going to be really interesting for this game number three because these first few Pokemon that hit the field will determine a lot in the pacing of how this game number three is going to go. Especially since you can't be disrespecting the rest of the team either. But the fact that you're trying to build around the best four Pokemon to be bringing up against this Parish song because that's the danger with changing the team up for this game three is all of a sudden you can make yourself really just weak to something else. And we know that there definitely is some strong tools over on Wolf's side, but it's time to hop in the game for game number three. It'll go back to the Fluttermane and Volcarona. No Fluttermane on Wolf's side though. That Palafin making a return next to the Amoongus. The Palafin, I didn't really feel like it did enough in that first game, so I'm intrigued to see what it does here. Yeah, it was able to get off a really nice jet punch, which is going to be that priority attack, at least being able to put some offensive pressure on the board. You could go for a raw switch, though, with the Palafin if you want to. You can see that Wolfie's kind of like playing around with, okay, do I switch the Palafin out here, or do I go for something like the jet punch? We saw that one-two punch come out in game number one, which was able to secure Wolf a knockout, but at this point, is it better to have the hero form Palafin in the back to be able to bring in? Do you need that offensive pressure, or can you really just go for a knockout here? That's one of those things that some Palafin players, it goes back to that predictability with always the swap out. So keeping it into attack, it's definitely something you can try and catch someone off a little off guard for. This, though, I think is fun. The Amoongus going to be terrestrializing to start things off with that dark type. Hey, it's trying its best to be a brute on it here, okay? Like, we're getting oh. that dark type back in, but it's a double protector from Chongjun, so not going to be able to take any damage from here. A nice way to kind of scout out the first turn, 
see if there's going to be, I feel like a swap could have been then necessarily free at this point with that Palafin, but at the same time, you'd be then be bringing in a Pokemon that maybe you didn't want in this scenario. So definitely a little bit of an interesting turn. And then you have to think, well, do I want to go for the same thing or do I want to swap it up this next turn? So you don't want to become predictable. Yeah, but well, we're going to see a swap here from Wolf. He's locked into switching out that Palafin in favor of one of his back two Pokemon. So you are preserving that Palafin for later when in hero form, you're going to be dealing absolutely devastating damage with those jet punches. You don't even need the rain to be active in order to make sure that you're getting off as much damage as possible. Um, but Chungchun here, after knowing that he played a double protect in that turn one, you're a little bit safer now. Maybe that's why Wolf is going to be going for a protect onto the Amoongus because that did give Chongjun a lot of trouble in those first two games. Well, there is that Palafin making that swap out, bringing the Arcanine, the Peckish, in its place. Make sure that Timothy's not really going to do too much in this case, but maybe could be taking a overheat or something better from the Volcarona. It'll be a Terrastalization. We're getting those out of the way early this time around. For the Volcarona, though, and this one going into that water type. Ooh, okay. So maybe expecting that there was going to be a jet punch coming that way, but this looks like one of the best options for Chongjun to go with. And, you know, you are using the Terra so early, but I hope it's going to be able to pay off here, especially with the Rage Powder. Would have directed away any sort of attack coming in from that Palafin as well. It would have been so nice. It would have taken it so much better. Moonblast, though into this Amoongus. It definitely wouldn't have appreciated the hit, but with that Protect, it won't really have to find out. No, it's not going to have to find out at all. But we did end up uh, seeing that Protect come through. So Amoongus is not as safe as possible at this point in time, but it's still threatening so much utility. You see this spore is still available. Palafin is ready to go, though. Look at that hero form active. And you still have the screen tail in the back with that booster energy. So you could swap that in as well, get that nice boost, um, and then see what happens from there. But it's going to be a moon blast here. Amoongus just going to have to tank it. And sure, it will survive through that first hit at least. And Fluttermane also with that survival from the Flare Blitz. Gonna do a lot of damage with the Focus Sash. Definitely clutching situations like oh, that, but uh, oh, not the going burn. to matter with the burn. The Focus Sash, I mean, it's burned up, but not gonna make its way through the end of the turn anyways. Overheat will take care of the Amoongus, so at least it will be a life for a life. Oh my gosh. I mean, yeah, you do get the Amoongus out of the way, but that burn is so crucial here. That Fluttermane is going to get knocked out, and you really were hoping to keep that alive as one of the fastest Pokemon available on Chongjun's team. You don't actually have Quiver Dance as a move on this Volcarona, and so that's not a way that you can really help yourself. So if, if Wolfie decides to switch to the Palafin, you do have those priority Jet Punches with that Mystic Water also being able to boost up those attacks, but the Screen Tail as well, just going to be one of the fastest Pokemon on the field. Yeah, and any sort of priority into that slot, like it would have been I mean, whatever, but now not even have to worry about it and can do damage in different types of way, including with this Screamtail, making its way onto the field, facing off against the Brute Bonnet on the other side. Yeah, the Brute Bonnet, uh, you do still have access to Sucker Punch. The Bullet Seed has actually been really nice too. We're seeing a lot of Brute Bonnet in Series 2 so far, carrying Loaded Dice, which ensures that a multi-hit move like Bullet Seed will hit at least four times, um, which usually is about a 15% chance to actually hit four, four or five times. Uh, but it's time to Parish Song, it looks like. I mean, Wolfie's in a position now where, yes, the Amoongus of his is off the field, so you don't necessarily have that regenerative power, but you're still going to force out those pivots. Force out a Rage Powder in this position. Not going to do too much against the Parish Song. I mean... It's very interesting position with the three Pokemon on each side, but yet again, forcing the pivots, forcing a weird board save is honestly quite great. Flare Blitz not going to be doing the most damage into the Volcarona, but instead just start being away. Four now in return, but no swap that's going to be hitting right into his safety goggles, and that's not going to do anything. No, I think maybe Chongjun was expecting to see a switch in for the Palafin. Um, but that is definitely not going to hit its mark here, and that puts Chongjun in a more difficult position than before, because now you still have that pressure of the Parish Song being on the board. Maybe you get a switch into the Palafin now, but you see the Brute Bonnet just sitting there as a duck. Is it a duck? It has a beak. 
It's a mushroom. It's just a prehistoric Yeah, but why does it have Pokeball a mouth? Mush <laughs> don't it ask looks questions like you don't want the answer to. It also to. has a tail, in case you guys didn't know. Fruit Bonnet does have a tail. It wags it. It's, it's kind of neat. And the moss that Dawes <laughs> hates so much about it. Here is the first pivot of the turn, though. We knew that there would be a pivot coming because at this point, you have to make sure that your Pokemon are making it through the turn. It'll be the King Gambit is fourth and final Pokemon protect for the Brute Bonnet to make sure that it's not going to go fade of any other attack. And Disable would have been the move into that. So really well done from Shangjin. And here, Will-O-Wisp also targeted into that. So really covering bases there. And the King Abbott definitely happy not to see that. Yeah, I, I think that this is just the smartest thing that Wolf could have gone for here. You're looking at just pinning down the Brute Bonnet so that it's not a problem for later. If you force out the Protect now, then you do have access to hit it for some super effective attacks. Um, but even just with the Disable, showing off that tech here, even though you can see it on the open team sheet, um, it's one of those moves that can be really, really critical in a match. If you shut down the Brute Bonnet's ability to spore, then you're shutting down a lot of its utility that it would be able to bring to this match, and then it's forced to go for more of those attacks like Bullet Seed and Sucker Punch, which you were covering for with the Will-O-Wisp as well. A really tricky situation at this point is the King Abbott with no protect. And the fact that the pivoting does have to have it on the Brute Bonnet to make sure that it wouldn't be going down to a pair song shortly. Putting the King Abbott in a really tough situation. First attack did a little bit. The Flare Bits is going to do a lot, but still not quite enough to be picking up the cape. Oh, and now how Cleave can take out the Arcanine. So now Wolf is down to his final two Pokemon here with the Screamtail and the Palafin. Uh, and the Screamtail is not able to be switched out here. So Wolf has to look at how he's going to be able to use that Screamtail for this final Parish count. At least the Palafin is able to make an appearance here. But with the Volcarona terrestrializing to that water type, those Jet Punches aren't going to be nearly as strong as they would have been if Volcarona had not Terrad. Uh, King Gambit is quite low, so maybe the Screamtail is going to be able to do something, or at least you get that knockout there and force the Brute Bonnet to make a reappearance. But Volcarona can just Rage Powder here and remove away all of that pressure. Instead, going to protect, make sure that it's not going to be taking a bunch of damage since that water type does fare better against anything from the Palafin. It's going to be a bit of damage with that Sucker Punch from the King Abbott before it goes down with this Play Rough from the Scream Tail, the last move it will be able to make in this battle. And now, close combat, sure, not going to do anything. It hits into the Protect, but notably, it's going to be a 2 to 1 battle as the Scream Tail's Parish count falls to zero and it's taken out. Yeah, with King Gambit also dealing in a decent chunk of damage here to that Palafin, you are able to get the Brute Bonnet back in for Chong Jun Pang, um, which is going to be still completely healthy. Uh, so now Chong Jun does have a chance to continue to go for Rage Powders or Protects. Just has to play around that, but his best option right now is to hope that Rage Powder doesn't come out and hits its mark with a close combat. But that's not going to happen. Yeah, the Rage Powder, the Palafin hitting into it. It does a considerable amount of damage, all things considered, but it's not going to be enough for the KO. And notably, the Defense and Special Defense is going to be dropping on the Palafin as well. Any turn that it wants to be going for something like this close combat, the Volcarona will restore a bit with that Citrus Berry. Now, the Bullet Seed, I mean, this is going to be the move to close things out. It can hit a couple of times with the Loaded Dice, but it only needs to be doing it twice to close out this match. What an exciting match between these two trainers, though. I mean, it, it really did come down to the wire there. Three full games in this set, but Chong Jun Peng showing how good he is at being able to position around. And that's really what it came down to in this set was positioning. Can Wolf position himself in a way that that Parish Song would be impactful versus Chong Jun Peng being able to position out of it? Yeah, and I mean, it was one of those live by the Parish Song, die by the Parish Song, because ultimately you did put Changjun in a really weird spot with needing to go for those pivots, but ultimately when you got yourself down to two Pokemon and one of them still had that Parish counter on it, you found yourself in a really tricky situation in Palafin. I mean, it did more than it did in that first game, I would say, but the thing is, is when you have two Pokemon to go against and your moves are just getting redirected, you're not doing nearly enough with it, so it was fun to see the Parish Song.
It's just not enough in that third match. In that match, it, it was a little bit tough there. I think especially when the Brute Bonnet is pressuring down that Palafin with those bullet seeds, yeah. and you know they're going to be able to hit their mark. You also have the defense drop there from the close combat, so that doesn't feel super good either. Um, but hey, Chung Jun Peng, hats off. That early water Terra was so nice for that Volcarona for the end game. Yeah, I worry sometimes with seeing something that's a little bit more defensive with those Terras that all of a sudden it's maybe useless or it's gonna come back and, you know, be something that you regret later on. But really being able to see Wolf's team like, okay, no, not gonna really regret this whatsoever. The Palafin could be a really big risk to me. So making this Water Terra, having this Rage Powder, making sure that nothing can ever really be done to the rest of my Pokemon was so nice and so well played. I think the other thing about the way that Chongjun used that Volcarona is that it wasn't necessarily always a, let me Rage Powder here and keep my partner Pokemon safe. It was maybe a Protect here is going to be the most impactful so that I do have the ability to save the Brute Bonnet for later or the Volcarona for later, just anything like that. And I think Chongjun is so good at being able to identify those moments where Protect is going to be better than just going for offensive damage. Yeah, because you want to make sure too, the Volcarona is a Pokemon, it's a living thing. You want to make sure that it could be making its way to the pivotal parts of the battle to protect to protect the Pokemon that needs it the most. In that moment, it was the Brute Bonnet because being able to make sure that stayed healthy, that wasn't going down to a close combat because that would have dealt some damage, having it be a dark type now yes. with this prehistoric Pokemon. So making sure it, that Pokemon is safe in that moment is so much more important and then just trying to absorb any ounce of damage thrown your way throughout the entire duration of the match. Yeah, I think it was just really well played by both trainers. I mean, one game apiece, and then having you go down the third game is always super exciting to see. And it's not over for Wolf either, right? One loss is not going to completely knock him out of the tournament. We still have six more rounds of Swiss to play today, as we do have a total of 10 rounds. It's uh, a lot of rounds. <laughs> it's a lot. I, I mean, Chungjun's off to a great start, though. He could get a repeat performance here. I mean, the number of top cuts that he had last season is so impressive. Yeah. Um, just like a win in Salt Lake City, multiple top cuts. At, and AIC in Milwaukee back to back yeah. last year was absolutely nuts and like I'm I'm happy to see that that him and as well as the rest of that community are, are doing so well in these tournaments um, and I can't wait to see what more can be done with the brute bonnet why that Pokemon out of all Pokemon I like it I, okay it's <laughs> And they torn. both they both have their uses right Amoongus versus brute bonnet even Volcarona versus Iron Moth. Yeah, we'll see Can what we happens. Can we agree that it's better than Screamtail? Screamtail has its niche, is all I will say. All right, all right. Okay, I'll, the Brew it was really cool <laughs> in that one. Being able to see the offensive Amoongus, I mean, respect. Because that Seed Bomb, that was really cool to see. And it's, you know what? Just the amount of Paradoxes and what they're able to do, I think it's cool. And I feel like it's a Pokemon that can do a little bit more. The Fluttermane, so strong, so powerful. Yeah. But we got to see both players like, all right, well, I'm going to spend my first turn Shadow Balling. And you kind of have to Shadow Ball for a Shadow Ball to make sure that the opponent's Fluttermane is getting chunked down. And it's a little bit more basic and predictable than this. <laughs> hey, I don't know. I think we're going to see a lot. We'll see what happens. I'm expecting to see a lot of Fruit Bonnet this weekend, but we still have so much more to show you. But what I do know is that we've got an interview over with Adam. So let's go ahead and head over there. Thank you so much, guys. Fantastic casting, as always. I'm joined by our round four winner, Shang Chun you. Kang. Uh, you've played against a fantastic player in Wolf. Uh, you are, of course, a fantastic player yourself. And it was probably my favorite match so far. Uh, I could, could stay up there for the rest of the day. We'll see how that goes. Um, you played against him playing a fabled Perish Song team. Uh, how were you feeling going into that matchup when you, when you exchanged those team sheets? Well, on the team preview, I think my Dandozo is pretty hard for this matchup because Dandozo is good to play a long game, but the Perish just block it pretty well. So I'm going to try the my other teammates to help Dandozo to finish the matchup. I think uh, my game plan in game one just to lead the uh, Volcarona and the uh, Fluttermine and try to see what happened. I think these two are the best lead for this. And I try to make some adjustment in game two, like lead the uh, King of Bat. Yep. Yeah. Uh, but I lose to the Ghost Tail. I think Ghost Tail is pretty good. So. Uh, in game three, I tried to lead the Volcarona and the Flutter Mine again. Mm -hmm. And on the, on the first turn of the game three, I see he lead 
uh, Among Us and Palafin. Yeah. So I just wanted to double protect and see what will happen. Yeah, it, it was a really safe turn and you kind of got that piece of information and you got to play around with that, which was really cool. Uh, one yes. thing the, the casters were talking about at length is that Volcarona um, yes. and how impactful it is, obviously. Uh, it's one of those Pokemon that's been getting a lot of attention again. How kind of pivotal is it to your team? Because it felt, it, honestly, watching game three, like there was just no answer to it. Uh, I think Volcarona is a good support Pokemon mm -hmm. and could uh, make threat to the Among Us. So I think he will lead Among Us again in the game three. So I decide to lead, lead back the Volcarona. It did pretty well. Yeah, it definitely yeah. it definitely worked out. Uh, obviously, we, we moved to series two coming into this tournament, and I know we had some, you know, changes going forward. Um, how when you you guys are team building? I know you've got like a group that you build with, right? How did you end up settling on the team that you've brought here for today? Uh, well, on the, on the series two, I think Dandozo is. Uh, it's harder to play than the series one. Mm -hmm. So I try to add some very offensive teammate and to and yeah, to feed the format. Yeah, uh, actually I was talking to, uh, I believe it was some of the other people earlier and they said, you know, it is a much more offensive format. Yeah. Um, how, does, uh, how does that align with you? Because I think watching you play, obviously last year, very different game, very different style. You've always played like really defensively and obviously you're doing great here, you know, undefeated so far. Yeah. How does that offensive vibe kind of sit with you? Do you feel comfortable playing it or is it just a real big change that you've had to go and learn? Yeah, I, I feel very comfortable to play with it. And yeah, I think Dandozo is very good for me. Yep. I, I really like to play Dandozo, yeah. Is there any, I mean, obviously it's been good in series one, it's, it's now good again in series yeah, two. Yeah, but I like, still want to play it. Yeah? yeah, just committed to the Dandozo. Yeah. Did you make any, I mean, I don't want you to give away too many secrets, but did you change like any of the moves or anything on it or just keep it the same old pair? Well, I just add some like Flutter Mine and Broad Bonnet, this, such Pokemon mm -hmm. I think is pretty good to the team. Uh, I think Broad Bonnet is very good, like uh, he, he can attack and click the spore, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, it, it's pretty flexible. Yeah, yeah. That, that was something I've been talking about with everyone. It's something I kind of want to get a beat on over the course of the day, right? Yeah. Is Paradox Pokemon are brand new. A bunch of them came in. We looked at the graphic earlier. It's like over half the room is playing Iron Hands. A huge portion of the room is playing Iron Bundle. You've gone with Fluttermane, which is right up there too, and the Brute Bonnet. Um, obviously, Brute Bonnet did really well in that game as well. Uh, how do we think you know the Paradoxes have uh, impacted the team building? And which one, if you had to pick one? for the whole kind of tournament yeah. to have a big performance, what would you go with? Yeah, I think, uh, firstly, I thought it was to pick one from the Iron Bundle and the Flutter Mine from the Paradise Pokemon. And uh, I really need a Pokemon like the Muscarada in Series 1. Mm -hmm. So I think Flutter Mine is, can, did really well, could, could do really well here. Like the Focus Sash and do some quick damage, like the Muscarada doing the in a series one. Well, I really like Iron Bundle, but like I have the Dandozo, it's a water type Pokemon. So I don't I don't want to have too much like water type Pokemon here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, maybe I can try the boost energy uh, Iron Bundle. I think my Iron Bundle bad matchup is not really good. Uh, you don't, By you the way, don't yeah. want to play it? Yeah, I don't want to play the clever Iron Bundle, I think. Oh, okay. Is there a certain like build of it you don't want to play, or just people who are like really experienced yeah. with it? Okay, that's uh, you know, you've given that one away, but uh, hey, I'm sure you'll be able to navigate it when you get thank there. Thank you, thank you. Uh, obviously, thinking about the last year or so, just over a year. Obviously, we came back to, to live events last year, and let's be honest, uh, since we came back, you've been you've been on a tear. Yeah. I've seen you at the top tables, literally the the final table, <laughs> in multiple occasions as well. Um, do you think that that's added like any pressure to you as a player? I mean, you just took down Wolf, who's obviously one of the huge names. Or I think it's fine since I've played on <laughs> stream table so much time. So yeah, so uh, yeah, I'm fine. I think gives you a, gives you yeah. an advantage. Yeah, uh, I think I just play like what I play in the in general, and and you know I played some good players like Eric Rios oh, yeah. and the Wolfie League like uh, James back on the stream before. I think I'm good. Yeah, so yeah. No, no additional pressure? You're no, I, I, I don't it. have any pressure. <laughs> that, that's but awesome. maybe playing like top card, I may feel a little pressure. Hey, yeah. there's nothing wrong with a little bit of pressure. Yeah. What, what's the rest of your season looking like? I love watching you play, so 
Where are you where are you headed next on kind of the, the big picture of things? Um, my next event would be OCIC. Okay. Yeah, Australia. And if I, did, I if I do really well on the OCIC, I may try EOIC then. Okay. Yeah. So you're trying to trying to keep it going, keep that. Oh uh, yeah, keep going. If I do re if I can do well. Yeah. Yep. All right. So Iron Bundle is something you, you don't want to play against. Is there anything else you you want to avoid for the day? Uh, I think. Uh, I think in general, down Dodo team in Series 2, we don't want to play like Terra Grass or Verona. Uh, it's a really hard matchup for me. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it should be the first one. I think Terra Grass or Verona is the most hard matchup for me. Yeah, it's definitely, yeah. definitely not an easy one. Yeah. Uh, definitely not. Um, just in general, uh, just kind of getting a read on the situation, uh, thinking about obviously phenomenal performances at the end of Sword and Shield from yourself. How are you, how are you enjoying the Scarlet Violet era? Just a, a wider kind of well, view on it. Well, I think uh, Scarlet and Violet format is uh, it's harder to grasp, mm -hmm. to be honest. I think I'll try to practice more and mix perfect. Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> you, I you're think, pretty close to perfect yeah, right I now. Think, yeah, I think uh, Scarlet and Violet for, format like Series 1 and 2 is harder than VGC 22. Okay. Yeah, I think it's harder for me. Yeah, well, you're, yeah. you're still doing really well. Even if it's harder, you. you're still still putting <laughs> on fantastic you. performances. So, with that said, congratulations on the win. Fantastic game on stream. Thank you for putting on a show for us. Thank you, Adam. Before I let you go, I will just say, and don't tell anyone else who said this, that you are my favorite. So, good luck in the rest of your rounds. And Thank we'll you. be right back for more action Thank here you. in Orlando very soon.